Welcome to the 206 Podcast. My name is Mark. I'm coming to you from Seattle, Washington, and this is the Changing Directions Filmmaker Interview Series. Joining me today is Jessica Kingdon, Director of Ascension, along with producers Kira Simon-Kennedy and Nathan Truesdell. Jessica, Kira, Nathan, welcome to the 206. Hi, thanks Hi. for having us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here. I appreciate you taking the time. Now, when I watched this documentary, I couldn't take my eyes off of the amazing imagery and the story unfolds in a very unique and engaging way. You unravel so many layers of China's culture and consumerism. Why was this an important topic for you to dive into? Um, I think uh, initially when I set out to make this movie, I was thinking about trying to show viewers in a visceral way um, the different sites of invisible economies that power the industrial supply chain that consumers are connected to on a day-to-day -day basis without realizing. So the film is actually bookmark bookmarked, um, bookended with these with places like this. So we open up in a low wage um, market for people looking for jobs working at tech companies like Foxconn and Huawei and the film closes um, in a rare earth mineral mine, which is these rare earths are used in order to make tech devices like right. um, smartphones and, and computers. Um, mm -hmm. So sort of like driving our tech dependent world. But in between all of that is all of this aspirational culture that is uh, relatively new to China in this form, but is not new to other parts of the world. So I was kind of trying to look at what capitalism looks like in a different context outside of our own Western culture. Yeah, it was definitely an eye-opening experience. So that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, Jessica, Ascension has a special sort of inspiration, I believe, from your great-grandfather. Would you mind talking about what that is? Um, yeah, the film actually talking about bookends is also bookended with a poem that was written by my great-grandfather in 1912. And when I set out to make this film, um, I didn't know uh, that, that, that we would do that at all. It was actually during, we had the film in four shoots and it was in the very last shoot that I even um, found these poems. And it was because uh, I told my mom that I was going to this city, Changsha in Hunan province, which is where an air conditioning factory was, where we were shooting um, the people in the military, like army uniforms doing the trainings. That was oh, that yeah. factory. And I mentioned to her, oh, I'm going to the city. And then she said, oh, you know, your grandfather and your great grandfather are from there. And I was like, what? I had no idea. Oh, wow. And so I mentioned this to Kira, who then put me in touch with a historian that she knows in that city. And um, he helped me trace down living relatives today. Oh, wow. And actually brought some of my great grandfather's poetry from a museum. I thought I was going to get to keep oh my gosh. books, but they lived in that museum. Yeah, it was crazy. It was totally unexpected. Wow. Um, yeah, and it was like on a day's notice too that they all showed up. And um, then, you know, flash forward to six months, a year later, um, when we're trying to brainstorm for the title of the film. And Carol was like, why don't you go back and look at some of these poems? And so one of them was called Ascension. And reading the, tra the translation, we found that a lot of the themes really resonated with what the film is about, which is one thing the film is about, is about the paradox of progress, which even though the poem was written over 100 years ago, it still resonates today. Wow. Yeah, it's always amazing to me how there's some things like that that are just timeless of things that involve culture and society. That's an amazing story, even, even more amazing than I initially thought. Thank you for going into that. Now, Kira, you also worked with Jessica on a short film called Commodity City. So tell me about the relationship the two of you have established as filmmakers and how you work together on making Ascension. 
Sure, yeah. Um, we originally met through our mutual friend, Isabel Chung, who's a great writer um, in Hong Kong. And at the beginning, when we met, Jessica had this beautiful, amazing footage from Yiwu, which is the world's largest wholesale market mm -hmm. outside of Shanghai. And um, she had been filming um, all these places that are really the nexus point between the factories in China and like all the dollar stores in the entire world. And um, if you haven't seen the short, it's online, you should go watch it. But then we really started thinking like, you know, what's the story here? Like all these places are incredible. And Jessica has an amazing, both like sense of humor and just observational style where we really bring people into the market. Um, and I think when I came on, it was just a question of like, how do we set this up as like, what's the, what's the structure and who can support? And one of the best things in working together has been finding um, just like applying to a lot of like residencies and nonprofits who have been so, so helpful in making all this happen. And I think originally it was like the short form editing residency at Camden. Um, and then- we, Which is where I met Nate actually. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, five years ago. And yeah, I mean, I think it was just, we, it was finding the right partners to support this vision and really kind of building out from it. And then um, right when we were about to premiere Commodity City, um, people always ask what you're doing next. So we yeah. really kind of snowballed it into like, maybe it's a series of shorts and Jessica was working on a couple other short films. Uh, and then we pitched all of this as a series at IFP week, uh, mm -hmm. four years, three years ago? 2017. 2017. Wow. And someone we met there was like, you know, why don't you make this a feature? Which is what Jessica wanted to do all along. And it really kind of worked that way, you know, starting with the concept, getting a little bit of funding, going to film more, Jesse would come back and edit, and it really just grew out from there. Well, it sounds like there was a lot of growth for each of you and together along this journey through the, through the filmmaking process. That, that's great. Thank you for explaining that. Now, Nathan, you've worked on so many different films, both as a producer, uh, as a cinematographer, and you actually wear both of those hats for Ascension. So tell me something about this documentary that stands out to you compared to other projects you've worked on. Um, I think this is the first project that I've worked on shot in a, in a different language than I understand. Oh. Um, so uh, what really stands out about this is the, the process and how it was made. Um, it was just a complete learning process and we kind of had to invent how to shoot and how to uh, tackle the edit. Um, which was a, a, a huge undertaking. But in being on the ground in China and shooting alongside Jess and like her setting the visual language, um, we were able to really focus on the visuals, um, which made it interesting because we, you know, we not only shoot, but we do our own sound. Um, and so normally when you're shooting a, a project like this, you will just be listening to what the person is saying and, and there's a lot going on in your brain. Sure. But this allowed us to really like focus in on on finding these like these very visual elements of this film. Um, and also it was Jess had a really uh, bold and huge vision for what this could be, um, which a lot of times people don't just completely run after that, you know. And so um, I don't know, it was it, it was a. Uh, completely different than any project that I've worked on, certainly. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Oh, a ahead. lot of times it was hard to put into words what exactly we were doing, but both Nate and Kara were really great about supporting me, even though not all of the times it was like exactly crystal clear what the story of this film was going to be. <laughs> oh, so. definitely. And then one thing I, you had mentioned uh, the, uh, you know, the, the sound, and the audio that you had, uh, some of the scenes is just like a, machinery in a factory working so you're just dealing with that sound and no dialogue so it was there like special considerations that you needed to to approach in making those type of scenes versus when somebody was was actually speaking or having a conversation yeah totally um dan deacon scored this film and yeah. did an amazing job um, composing the music to it and early on we brought him on board and we told him that we wanted the factory sounds and on location sounds to inform his score. Mm. So we would go out of our way to really um, try to pick out the individual sounds of different types of machinery or 
um, at the beginning of the film, there's also a bicycle graveyard, which is where all of these rideshare bikes are disposed right, um, right. instead of being fixed because it's cheaper to just throw them out and make new ones instead of fixing them. Um, and so the beep, like, you know, just small things like the beeping of those individual bicycles um, or just any sort of individual machine would go out of our way to record separately from from dialogue. Yeah, we had a standalone audio recording device that was just specifically for that, where you would find rhythmic sounds in usually in factories. And we would just record those all too. like we had at the end of it, we had a card that was just a lot of factory sounds. Right. No, that's theory, impressive. Like, oh, go ahead. Amusement park sounds yeah. from an abandoned music park. And like, there's a lot yeah. of music that's in the background that um, also just kind of informs the tone of the film. Yeah, because even though Dan scored it, we also had a lot of like diegetic music that mm. we go out of our way to record as well, because that felt important to pick up the textures of, of daily life. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Now, Jessica. This is your first feature film, as we mentioned, although you have made several short films, so you do have some experience, but all of this level of detail that you're talking about, I'm surprised that this is your first feature because it seems like there's so much experience and knowledge that's, uh, knowledge that's gone into it. So what has been the biggest challenge or learning experience for you uh, coming out of making this film? Um, challenge of making it, the film? Yeah. I think because... Um, just generally in my life in projects, I realized a pattern that I uh, that I do is sometimes I take on something that's too big mm. um, and try to say too many things at once, which I think especially a lot of people starting out in their in their careers in the arts or whatever um, make the mistake of trying to say too many things at once. Right. Um, instead of trying to just say the simple thing. And so with this, and I've done that a lot in my past projects and just always was trying to simplify. And with this, there are so many different layers to it. And I wasn't sure if I could pull it off, to be honest. But um, that, so that was such a challenge because there's not one singular message or one singular story behind it. A lot of it is about this interconnectivity. Right. So I think having this sustain itself for 97 minutes as a, as a singular piece and be cohesive, that was definitely the hardest part. But I would say that a lot of it was just kind of being really rigorous in what I included and what I didn't include and, you know, leaving a lot of things behind that we shot or even like giving up the idea of shooting certain things. Um, there was early on this film what had more of an environmental aspect and I wanted to focus a lot more on e-waste or electronic waste, um, which is, you know, like all of our thrown away cell phones and right. But that idea just didn't work out for many reasons. Um, and it just sort of took away from the focus of the film. Wow, interesting. Now, uh, Kira or Nathan, anything to add as far as challenges in the filmmaking process for you guys? Go ahead. I mean, I think, um, honestly, I've, I've worked on a lot of projects too. And one thing that's kind of magical about this one is I feel like we got extremely lucky with everything happening at the right time. Mm. Um, even just, you know, finishing filming right um, in December 2019, right before everything shut down with COVID, right. being able to edit during the time when it was really mm -hmm. uncertain. And even the whole moment where we had no idea if we would ever see it with an audience, um, but premiering at one of the first film festivals that was back in person, that was outdoors. Um, we know so many filmmakers who got caught on in, you know, they were in the middle of shooting or they didn't get to... Yeah with audience right. and we got so lucky yeah. um on that front and that was um unexpected um something that has been so challenging for a lot of people that we really are grateful for that worked out for us sure yeah absolutely the the edit was a huge undertaking as well because everything had to get translated um and then it's also just and, and jess edited the film as well um in order to take all of those disparate elements and make it into a cohesive um, line was, I mean, it's always a challenge, but this was like something different since you're not following characters from place to place. No, right. absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that was done so well is that editing because there is a, a clear through line while there's so many different things happening. So I would say that was a job well done with that challenge. So now question for everyone. What are your favorite movies that have influenced your own work? Hmm. Um, 
I don't really have favorite movies, but some of my, I guess, favorite movies <laughs> um, are like Koyasasi, which a lot of people reference for this film, even oh. though I think they're really different. Um, but films that have more influenced this film are like Michael Blauberger's Working Man's Death or yeah. um, Our Daily Bread by Nicholas Gerhalter. So okay. more of like European aesthetic documentary filmmaking styles. Sure. I think it had like a, a film to me that has similar tones of um, great cinematography and great use of audio is Mandabala. Oh. By Jason Cohn. Sure. Yeah. Which a great is example. One of my favorite films. Yeah. One of the, um, the projects that I first thought of when uh, Jessica was kind of thinking through this, actually, um, Agnes Varda has a great short called The Daguerreotypes. Ah, uh, okay. That uh, really resonates well with Commodity City and this idea of kind of like going, um, you kind of from vendor to vendor. And personally, I think there's so many great documentary filmmakers working in China. Um, who are also showing the the human side of the labor aspect. Um, there's a great documentary called We the Workers, which shows how labor organizing actually happens in China that you got to see in Rotterdam. Um, and I think it's it's a very perilous subject, but it's um, all of that is, I think this film works so well with so many others that um, can kind of give a complete picture of, you know, how, how all of that works. Um, yeah, hard to pick favorite movies. <laughs> that is true. So people ask me that question and I'm like, you know, we could be here for hours and never never find the, the right answer or come up with a million answers. So, but thank you for indulging me on that question. Now, mm -hmm. also a question for everyone, uh, who inspires you that's not a filmmaker? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, also, just so many journalists. I mean, so much of the work for this film, I think these stories get uncovered by investigative journalists um, and thinking about places that um, break these stories around e-waste or the um, supply chains and things that we don't really have access to. We wouldn't know about so many of the locations in this film if it wasn't for um, someone who had gone and either like a photojournalist or someone who wrote a story mm. um, and, you know, there was so much research that went into trying to figure out where these places were and we never would have been made, able to make this film if it wasn't for all of that. So I think that's yeah. a huge inspiration, whether it's through, you know, text or even like radio journalism, um, yeah. definitely resting on those shoulders. Yeah, that's a great point. Like, uh, it, I just started reading uh, a book by Kira's friend, Blockchain Chicken Farm by Xiao Wei Wang. Um, <laughs> which is a great book. I haven't finished it yet, but she's, she's a great writer. And then um, Jenny O'Dell is another great writer, um, journalist, philosopher, thinker. So um, yeah, I would say like a lot of writers who are doing groundwork and ground research. Right. I think you're just caught me off guard and I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Thank you. Now, moving on then. So Ascension is in the middle of an amazing festival run, as Kira, you mentioned a minute ago, and it's playing in theaters around the world and winning awards and nominations pretty much every step of the way. So what has this festival experience been like for each of you, especially as we've begun that transition to a hybrid and in-person festival experiences again? Um, yeah, I mean, we've been like very really lucky with our festival run and um we've only most of them have been domestic that we've gone to in person we did get to go nate and i went to zurich film festival you're nice. gonna go to ridm yeah Montreal. Montreal in a few weeks. um but i mean in a typical year you know it would have been nice if we could have gone because one of the great things about festivals is just like getting to go to other places of the world that you normally wouldn't get to go to um, but just, I just feel a lot of gratitude mostly for being able to screen this film in as many places as we have and gotten to have this kind of in-person experience the way that we have. I think it was interesting going, going to Zurich and, um, again, being able to meet up with other filmmakers, especially people from other countries in the world and just talking about the experiences that everyone has had over the past two years, like either politically or socially or, you know, health wise. Um, and just 
realizing how important that actually is to be able to do that and share information. Right. Uh, and I didn't realize how much I had missed that until I got there and was able to do it. Yeah, there was these really special moments. We all got the chance to go to Camden um, and something about seeing these folks that we hadn't seen in so long and people just being like, how are your last two years? Yeah. And no one can just be like, oh, great. You know, and it really was, I think, much more vulnerable and much more, um, it was just such a special time to be back together and, you know, watching movies. And yeah, I don't think any of us realized how much we missed it until we were back in it. And I think that's one of the things that's been consistent, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that's been consistent about the conversations that I've had with filmmakers about the festival experience is while everything was shut down, that's the one thing that people missed was that it's, you know, it's a networking opportunity. It's a way for people to get together and just be together. And I think you brought up a good point, Nathan. It's a way to to communicate and share knowledge and, and share information and, ju and just share what's going on in our lives. So I'm glad that you're all able to have that experience during, during this festival run. And Jessica, you had mentioned uh, being grateful and having gratitude about being able to pr present the film. So expanding on that a little bit, what comes to mind about the entire filmmaking process that gives gives you a feeling of gratitude? Um, well, I just feel really lucky that I was able to even do it because mm. um, just to have this um, sort of artistic vision that I was able to follow through on and we got extremely lucky in the funding process as well. Um, it just, it really did feel and still does feel like a once in a lifetime opportunity, um, mm. truly. So. But just the whole thing, like getting to travel around to all of these locations in China. Like I've been to more places in China now than I've been anywhere in the world, than oh, I've been wow. in the States um, where I grew up. So just feeling so lucky to have gotten to see all these places, meet all of these people, but also while being able to um, make my film the way that I want to at the same time. Um, I just feel like I don't know if I'll get another chance like that. And all, to have the kind of reception as well that we've had, um, we weren't expecting so many people to like it in the way that they do. So yeah, that's kind of what I, the gratitude where it comes from. Oh, that's great. Especially that audience reaction. That's got to be like the most heartwarming, you know, sense of accomplishment type feeling. So uh, Kira, Nathan, anything to add on that? Yeah, it's, it's so special. I mean, kind of eavesdropping after hearing as people walk out of the room and the things that they're talking about, and the fact that this film is bringing up so many different conversations, everyone's resonating with a little different piece of it, mm -hmm. which moments are sticking with people. It's been so, so phenomenal to hear. And I've had a friend texted yesterday and they said they they just watched it twice. Like they went to go see it again. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they could pick up on more videos. Yeah. And that I was just like, that's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. And I think that's very true is there's so much involved with this movie. It needs at least a, a, a second look, if not a third and a fourth. So that's great to hear that you're getting that feedback as well. Yeah, and I've had random people email me too or message me on Instagram or something. Um, it's also nice when people like Asian Diaspora message me as well and feel a connection to this film and like it on many levels, like on an artistic level and a cultural level. Um, and sometimes people are like, oh, sorry to randomly reach out to you. Like, I know this is so random, um, but, you know, I loved your film. And I'm like, no, that's not random at all. That's the best thing to hear when a stranger who has yeah. like no stakes in anything will just randomly reach out to you. Oh, yeah, that's that is amazing that you're getting that feedback. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, thoughts on that? I mean, the, the, we've got an amazing press as well from the, the, the write ups are all very smart and uh, and great. And that's. You know, rare a lot of times, especially for films like this, I think, like, it seems like people are really responding to it. And, you know, creative documentary is a hard thing to ingest for some people. People say, you know, it's not for everybody, but it seems to be for a lot for of everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. No, that's great. And one thing, and going back to what you had just mentioned as well, Jessica, with the Asian diaspora, is... One thing I thought about is, or I guess one thing I've learned over the last couple of years in having these conversations and watching these type of films is that the Asian American experience is vastly different from the experience in China or Japan or Korea. So it sounds like you're still getting a reaction where people are connecting with it and seeing things that they can relate to. So can you speak on that a little bit more? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had 
reactions from Chinese Americans, but also Chinese nationals still um, who live in China. Um, so I think it kind of reaches a cross culture in this weird way, which is what I had hoped for it to do. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I've had a couple of friends um, who uh, either from China who are living here, who one of the first things someone's like walking out was just like, oh, it made me miss being in China. Like it felt like <laughs> being there, like so much for bringing me yeah. back. And um, and they had lived there just up until the pandemic. Um, and I think it, it really kind of, um, yeah, it's really touching a lot of people. And I think if you've spent some time in China or you have family from there, but you've never been, it resonates on a very different level. Um, but we've been hearing from all kinds of people that, you know, there, a lot of people just feel a connection um, through just certain moments. They feel, um, you know, a, a photographer who uh, is a photojournalist who's from China um, came up after a screening and said that he had covered a lot of similar types of locations as a journalist, but that what Jessica did made it feel like he was seeing them entirely with new eyes. Oh, wow. And that was some of the highest praise, I think. We yeah, got I've had um, other people from China, filmmakers from China say that they've seen these places, but it feels different this way. And I think it's because the space that the film is inhabiting is like an insider outsider perspective simultaneously. I mean, more of an outsider perspective really. Um, so I think that brings a different light to it. Oh, that makes total sense. Thank you for going into that. And uh, I think that's a, a great place to, to bookend this conversation. So Jessica, Kira, Nathan, thank you for taking the time. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, today. really fun. Thanks, yeah, Thanks thank for you. these questions and your thoughtful questions. Really appreciate it. The documentary is Ascension. This is Jessica Kingdon, Kira Simon Kennedy, and Nathan Truesdale. My name is Mark, and this is the 206 Changing Directions Filmmaker Interview Series. All interviews and movie reviews are available on 206.com, including my review of Ascension. You can learn more about the documentary by going to ascensiondocumentary.com. Also, Paramount Plus subscribers, you have access to Ascension right now, so go check it out. Thank you so much. Be safe and see you next time.